In the jewelry and metals world, there are people and services out there who can simply do some things more efficiently and cost effectively and even perish the thought better than I can. Things like hand engraving or platinum casting, maybe laser welding, things that I can't or just don't want to do myself. There are professionals who can do it for me. Job it out. The short three word mantra will set you free and allow you to soar, I like that, soar beyond the limitations and capabilities of your studio. This is outsourcing. Here to talk about some of the possibilities available locally to all of us are our four outsourcing speakers. What I'll do is I'll introduce them one at a time, um, and then they'll speak, and they'll take a seat at these chairs, and then afterwards we'll have 15 minutes to uh, ask questions. So please hold your questions till, till afterwards. Our first speaker, from sprue to button, vacuum to centrifuge, James Magiteri, owner of Outcast, will open the door into the mysteries inside the casting flask and the business of casting. Outcast, his business, is like one of the go-to uh, casters for many of us, and Kevin spoke, um, I think, glowingly of him. So please welcome James Magiteri. James? Well, uh, I would say good morning, but it's not quite morning anymore. And uh, Mr. Crane is a tough act to follow. Um, what I'd like to talk with you today about is kind of how Outcasting Company got its start in Seattle. Uh, we entered the industry as helping artists get over the handmade hump in their jewelry lines. The um, a lot of artists start out making pieces one at a time, handmade, and as they progress, they discover that, oh, I have this one great part that sells really well, but I gotta make a hundred of them the same because I got orders for these parts. They end up spending all their time at the bench making hundreds of parts. Well, and that's kind of where we fell in a lot of artists kind of wish they had that magic elf that would hop out from under their bench and make that part for them. Well, Outcast and Company and other casting shops are that magic elf. Some of you may recognize Mickey's work. What some of you may not know is that this part right here is actually a cast piece. And there's quite a few artists that have come to us to help us get by this place where they can't reproduce the same part over and over again exactly the same. Handmade parts can be reproduced these days uh, via silicon molds and casting processes. There's all kinds of places you can get parts made from die struck parts to laser engraved parts. Primarily, we're a casting shop that gives artists the opportunity to get back some of the time they spend on the bench hand making parts. So you can see from the last slide to this one, there's a part that gets reproduced in a different fashion when it's in a finished piece of jewelry. Having pieces cast for your line ultimately gives you back some of that time to design and create new parts. And what is time to an artist? To some, time equals money. To some, time equals freedom. Freedom to create. Freedom to create new things. Here you can see a part that is reproduced. I mean, knowingly, how long would it take you to carve a small twig of a branch out of silver hundreds of times to make earrings to fill orders. That's where cast parts come in. Gives you back some of that time so you can spend a little more time either doing your marketing or designing or creating from, the, from your uh, business without having to spend all of your time doing production work or hiring people and training them how to make your parts. And again, you can see in this part, there is the piece that was created from that uh, mold and those waxes that were in the last slide. And again, this part that gets reproduced 
gives you time back to be creative. And again, how parts can be reused in different forms or fashions. So, where to begin? Usually what I like to tell people if they're coming to me looking for cast parts is find the least favorite part that you're making the most of <laughs> that you don't want to make anymore. <laughs> Your best seller. That piece that you go, I, I've actually known artists that stopped selling a good selling piece of jewelry because they were just simply tired of making it. Well, that's where we come in. So it also opens a possibility when you take, when you start having parts reproduced in this fashion, it opens a possibility because now you have all these little pieces and parts to play with that you can go, oh, wait a minute, I never thought about using this part in this fashion. Or I could do this with it. And you can see here in this slide that uh, this component right here gets used in a couple of different pieces that Mickey's making. So it gives you the opportunity to use the same part in different ways. And again, you can see this piece that she's produced here. There's not a left and right to it. It's the same part, just flipped back and forth. Makes a great pair of earrings. So, not everything we make on the bench, handmade, can reproduce well in castings. There's a limit to what cast parts can do. If we get into the metallurgy of silver, silver casts with voids in it naturally. That's why we hammer condition metal after it's been uh, annealed or foraged or ingots cast. You got to get rid of the voids in it. So it's not applicable to things like, well, I had a client come to me one time that wanted to cast their ear wires because they just were not down with bending wires all the time. Cast ear wires, probably not a good idea. So it takes a little bit of time to sit and figure out exactly how you can deconstruct components in your line that could then actually be reproduced. The other thing to be aware of is you start with one size part, it goes into a mold. The wax that you use to reproduce the mold, which if some of you don't know, I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar with it, these parts here are actually waxes from this silicon mold. And that is actually the type of silicon mold that Kevin was speaking of in the previous presentation. When you go to that wax stage, you lose volume you lose size, you lose thickness. Uh, it's not standard. It varies depending on what the shape of the part is by volume, by length. Sheet comes out thinner and smaller. Openings in flat pieces become larger rather than shrinking because the part shrinks away from itself. So it's, it's a good idea to sit with somebody and discuss what it is you're wanting to reproduce before you run down the road of making a whole bunch of masters that you're gonna to run to the casting shop and here I need these parts made. Be a good idea to consult with somebody in the shop you're gonna work with before you go making all these masters to deconstruct your line. Keeping in mind that the finishing process you're gonna be using, again, is gonna be different than what you're used to. If you're using mill products, wires, sheet, uh, die struck bezels, that type of stuff in your work, the finishing process for those are gonna be a lot different than the finishing process with cast parts. So you may have to alter the tools you're using slightly to accommodate the parts. Um, a lot of the times if the pieces are engineered well, there's not a lot of cleanup and not a lot of finishing work that goes into them. And you can still retain that handmade look from cast parts. The uh, other thing that some people may or may not use is the, uh, machine finishing. Oftentimes cast parts will machine finish well if not as well as some milled products. But again, it's a matter of kind of figuring out what it is you don't want to make and what you want to reproduce. 
and how you can deconstruct that part to be used in the cast process. And lastly, you get back what you put in. Casting and molds don't mysteriously make flaws disappear. I've been in situations where I've been the bad guy for making a casting that has porosity, but the mold material that we use is so accurate that I've written a part number on the back of a part with a Sharpie magic marker and the wax injections that came out of that mold had the part number on the back of the part because you could see the Sharpie magic marker. And in some cases, that came out in the casting. So it's what you, get into the pro what you put into the process in the beginning is what you're going to get back. Casting doesn't make the flaws go away. We could talk about the pros and cons of adding cast parts. Some people are bench jewelers who like to make everything themselves. Their technique and their process is driven by what they do at the bench. Some people are looking to expand and they don't, there's components and pieces that they could have cast. But reaping the rewards of reproduci reproducibility, as the slide says, if you get an order for 100 parts, it might be far easier to have a portion of those 100 parts made in castings rather than fabricating everything from scratch. This ultimately would be a kind of difficult I know I wouldn't want to make that shape right there on the bench every time, a hundred times, because I know that a hundred times they wouldn't come out all the same on my bench, being a caster. <laughs> I would make one, make a mold, and then make many. And that again is a piece that Mickey uses in a lot of different scenarios in her line. Ultimately, this process can get you over that handmade hump if you experience the place where you want to get your time back because you're spending too much time filling orders, making these parts. Casting is one place where you can get those parts, or excuse me, those times back. So, again, it's not for everybody, but if you'd like to talk about the possibilities, you can contact us. I probably won't be the guy answering the phone. Denise Anderson is our production manager. I think she's here somewhere. Wave, Denise. <laughs> Schedule an appointment with her. Talk about the possibilities. Talk is always free. And uh, we love the company. And um, also, lastly, last night, Mickey asked me to bring this point up, and I don't know if many of you know, we're a former gold rush state. So I know a lot of you buy metal. A lot of you buy probably mill product. If you change your thinking just a little bit and you have the ability to alloy your own metals or cast your own ingots, make your own sheet with a rolling mill, there's a little shop in Northgate called Northgate Rare Coin and Precious Metal that I buy silver and gold from. If you go and buy fine silver or fine gold from coin shops, not the uncirculated coins that you're going to be selling for trade value or numismatic value, the beat up trade units, the old ingots of gold, the old ingots of silver, you can get them for close to market value and there is no sales tax on raw materials in the state of Washington. So you go buy an ounce of gold you're going to pay maybe 5 to $10 over market for that ounce of gold, either in a coin, a damaged maple leaf from Canada, a Swiss credit, without paying sales tax on top of it. And a lot of, you know, a lot of times we'll pay, we don't pay sales tax because we're passing it along to our customers, but that's a great way to get metal without paying a manufactured cost for mill and wire. But in that note, I say thank you for having me here. And uh, again, Mr. Crane was a tough act to follow.
sir. A tough act to follow, but not impossible, apparently. James did a great job, much appreciated. Took his seat on the dais, as it were. Um, I was going to say something, I forgot. I had something real pithy to say, eh, whatever. Um, our next presenter is the head of the medals program at, oh, I know, I know what I wanted to say. Uh, if you, and I hope I'm not crossing any boundaries, but we, we encourage you guys to talk to our uh, outsourcing presenters during lunch if you want to continue your questions. And I know they're really excited to talk about what it is they do. Anyway, head of the medals program at North Seattle Community College, Lynn Hall, and former um, committee member, will turn us on to the process and possibilities of metal spinning, and then clue us into some local pro uh, providers. Please welcome Lynn Hall. I'm really happy to be here today um, to talk about metal spinning. It's a process that I've been in love with for the last 30 years or so. Um, I was introduced to the spinning process in graduate school at RIT. Gary Griffin was interested in somebody taking up the idea of uh, using industrial processes to uh, produce their work, maybe make them more affordable. And uh, I was told at the time that I would, in learning the process, that I probably would run dry with ideas, but I can tell you that after 30 years, I still have things uh, and ideas of how I want to produce working on the lathe. So um, I am. Um, I'm going to kind of approach this a little bit differently. It's not going to be so much about process, but it's going to be, OK, so you go to industry. They make you a, a bowl. What do you do with that? How do you turn it into having content? How do you turn it into having a personal expression? And where you go from there? So I'm going to show you some images of my work, how I've taken those basic forms, changed them, and then also several other artists that are using um, industry to produce their spun forms and then altering them on that. The first thing I wanted to show you was um, a video, so let's see if we can pull this up. So one of the things I do want to say is when I did go online and start looking for videos, I was stunned at the amount of uh, videos that were out there on spinning, and I would really encourage you guys to take a look at some of them. So I put together, the, this is just a one minute thing that's showing you, this is um, in industry. These are aluminum forms that are being spun. But what I wanted you to see is um, working in my studio, one of the things I love doing is trying to grow metal take it from being flat sheet metal and making it into something. And the spinning process is probably the most ideal way to actually see the malleability and the elasticity that metal has. And for me, studying with John Marshall and learning how to move metal, this was just a really direct link for me to move on. Um, so these are um, Delrin um, tools that are being used. These are being operated by some person. They're not um, robotic. And you can see that this aluminum metal that's about 043 is just moving beautifully, um, not needing to take it off or anneal it or anything. Um, so Century Metal Spinning Company is in Minneapolis. Um, I've got listed on the handout that Molly put together, which I appreciate her doing, three local companies that I have worked with um, and would recommend you contacting them. Um, but I just kind of wanted you guys to get an idea of some of the things that are being produced and how the aluminum sheet metal um, can be formed. Okay. Hopefully that was helpful. So anyway, I want to talk just briefly about a couple of things for you. If you were going to go to a spinning company and have them uh, do a form for you, you can kind of do it in two ways. You could take a, a profile drawing of the form that you're looking for, and you could have them produce the uh, mandrel, or what I call pattern. So they're the pattern makers. So that is this portion. Um, and that is a custom piece that can be made. That's where the expense comes into being, is hiring that person to produce that pattern for you. But once that pattern's been made, you can have thousands of parts made off of it. So when I um, was first initially looking into hiring it out, I went and I actually looked at the patterns. And you go in and you can just see thousands of patterns at Vans Metal Spinning of all different shapes, forms, and sizes. You might be able to bypass having that expense by finding something that's already been produced produced, and then using that form and having the parts made off of it. So that the mandrel is the part that the metal is spun over, um, and that's probably the main thing to think about, and that would be an option for you. If you have something more specific in mind, then you'd have to negotiate with them about the cost of, of the, making the pattern. Having one piece is as expensive as having 20 pieces made. 
because of the setup time on the lathe. So if you're going into thinking about doing this, you might think about multiples right off the bat. Um, saves cost. And then once again, 100 parts are going to be a lot less expensive than even 20 parts. So I would go in, talk to them, see what they have to say, get prices and quotes, um, find out about what materials that they actually work in, whether they do do copper, brass, whether they're working in silver. I know that some of the companies, if you bring the materials, they'll actually use your materials. That would be another way to negotiate if you have um, stock with materials that are on there with that. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of things right off the bat. For me, um, when you start looking at spun forms, you think of the woks that you cook with. You think of the cookware. You think of hubcaps. You think of ventilator systems on the hood, on top of a roof. And so, what do you, how do you how do you take those those um, forms and make them into something? Um, interesting, personal, maybe having some content. This is one of the earliest pieces that I did. It's only about six inches in diameter, but it's spun aluminum. And so when I was learning the spinning process, I worked in aluminum because it was cheap and it allowed me not to have to stop and anneal along the way. But one of the things that I was encouraged to do is to remove the tooling marks. Um, off my pieces, that if you were going to spin something, you didn't want anybody to know that that's how you, how you made it. Um, granted, this was 30 years ago. But for me, what I loved was the tooling lines. And the reason why I talk about that is I think of them as being growth rings in how the metals formed. So every time you make a pass on, on the lathe, those lines are left there. And I think of it as being very clay-like. The other thing is, is um, leaving that um, uneven edge was something that I could um, do because I was actually working on the lathe myself. These are things in talking to um, the people that produce things is you can talk to them about what you're looking for in the way of ideas. So this is a um, teapot that I did when I was in graduate school. And it has a, it's a form that comes back in on itself. And that requires a very special, unique um, pattern. It's called a breakdown chuck, so that you can actually take the wood out afterwards. Um, they're very labor intensive. They're expensive. They don't hold up really well. So um, I kind of shortly after producing a few of these pieces abandoned that idea and decided I would find ways to put parts together without having to make a breakdown chuck. So um, these are some examples of that. Um, this particular um, piece here is basically bezel set. So this top piece was spun. The bottom piece, actually, um, the edge was still soft, and I was actually able to bezel set. So a lot of the processes that I learned in jewelry making, I'm using in my spinning um, for you. So I just kind of wanted to remind you of that. And then multiple parts, stacking, assembling, um, is also another way to go. This is an aluminum piece that's been painted with automobile paints. So another assemblage of multiple spun parts put together, um, either riveted, tabbed, or screwed together. So um, another thing about the spun forms is when you take them off the lathe, you can do something with them. You don't have to hold it as that being the only thing. So I did a whole series of purse forms where I actually took the pieces off the lathe and then altered them, formed them, and shaped them. Um, this is another example of uh, bezel setting. So I have that outside form and I have the inside form fit down in nice and tight because it's done on the lathe, but I have the ability to actually burnish the edge down and hold it as a bezel set so it becomes one piece. And it was my solution to getting around having to make those breakdown checks. So, and then these are just some examples of if you're going to make one part, you set up and on the lathe and you're ready to go, you might as well make 15 of them and then think about assemblages. So James is talking about the cast parts. It's the same thing with spinning. It's wonderful to all of a sudden throw on your workbench five or 10 of these same things and figure out what you're going to do with them. It reminds me of building blocks that are there. So this is both aluminum and copper assemblage. And once again, a lot of the bezel setting technique so um, another thing I think about is, is spinning one form on top of another form on top of another form. So I think about you know when you slice open an onion and how you have all the different layers. So these are some of the bowls that I've produced where I've done multiple layers, um, stacking them together. So um, another process that I stumbled along was um, spinning a hemisphere. And then while it's still on the lathe, going back in and cutting off bands. So I ended up with sections, bands, that then I took off the lathe and I reassembled. Um, so the one on the left has two hemispheres that were turned 
and then cut with one inch banding, taken and then reassembled and soldered back together again. So I'm trying to give you some ideas of thinking where you can go beyond with the spun parts. And then the one on the right has also been done that way. So, and then um, patinas, they just fall naturally into these huge big surfaces that you're working on. Um, and then all of your guys' um, fabricating skills as, as um, jewelers and smiths, adding handles, those kind of things. Um, another um, basket forms that I've done in the way of series of things. Um, the one on the left has actually been soldered together. There's a very fine line, where's my, uh, right around there where it's two parts. And then once again, the other one has been bezel set. So these are a little bit more recent pieces that um, are pieces that have come off the lathe. Once again, I've really taken advantage of trying to have the tooling lines show up. I've actually accentuated them where I've cut into the patterns so that there is some hills and valleys that are on there. And then these are folded up and brazed together. And once again, automobile paints. So, and then a series out of that. This is threesome. So, um, these are some small containers that I've built um, and that are also then patinaed, um, but they've got some jewelry um, techniques involved in it with cast parts on top. Um, but the way that the lid works is, is this bottom section is a hemisphere. I've done a second hemisphere, but I've just trimmed a little band, dropped it down in and soldered it in place, and I've had. So it's not sheet that's been bent up and soldered together. It's actually a spun part that's been dropped down in. Gives a nice ledge for the, the lid to fit on. And so it's all those kind of little um, mechanical things that I love working out in my studio. So um, I threw this in because this was a squash that I grew in my garden last summer. <laughs> and it inspired me, my Siamese twins um, squash, to do a wall vase that were two spun pieces that then I've altered and assembled after that. Um, the next series of slides are um, artists that are using the spinning technique. Karen Pierce is from Colorado, and she's using um, an industrial spinner in Boulder that is spinning the forms for her, and then she's coming back in. You can see that she's piercing, altering, and uh, creating her vessel forms. This is another uh, piece of hers that is spun. This is about 22 inches in diameter. So. Um, spun part on top, it's a seamed piece on the bottom. Another spun form and then she's gone back in and etched the surface. So using a heavier gauge piece of metal that you spin and then going in and etching the surface creates that lovely texture that she's created. So another one of her um, spun parts and she's um, soldered her pieces together. There's three, three spun parts that are um, part of this, this vessel. Um, Boris Valley, everybody knows him. He's an amazing wizard in the way of ingenuity. Um, and I've got a few of his spine pieces. He's actually taken the street signs that he's using and taking them to industry, having them spun. Um, and the, what's amazing is, is that the metal and the paint still seem to stay together in the forming process. And granted, these are relatively shallow bowls, but they are slapped on the lathe with the paint intact on them. So, and this is a whole series of ones that he did. So he's able to uh, produce a lot of work quickly. So and these are some of his early pieces from graduate school that were spun. Um, Babette Holland, um, Lisa Kerr turned me on to her and her, um, her production pieces for anodized aluminum pieces are just magnificent. She works hand in hand with an industrial spinning company and also hand in hand with an anodizing company to be able to really create these lovely, lovely surfaces on these anodized aluminum pieces. But they're all spun. You can see how she's approached the components and the way of putting them together. And so she does vases, beautiful surfaces and lights, lighting, and these spun aluminum lights, and more table lamps. Um, Harlan Butt, I just saw him last year at an enameling conference, and he said, Lynn, I just bought my second lathe. And I said, what, Harlan? Because he was having things spun. Um, and then he bought a small lathe 
uh, really enjoyed the process of the spinning and now has got, stepped up to a little bit larger lathe. But his pieces are spun and there are actually two parts that are spun and then soldered together and then he's gone back in and hammered the surfaces on them. So um, it was really neat to see that Harlan's taken on actual um, spinning of his forms these days. So and we're all familiar with his amazing enamel work. So these are spun forms that he's gone back in and added fabricated parts to um, and the enameling. So one of the things I do want to say is spinning is, spun forms are different than raised forms. Um, it's a stretching process, so if you want a heavy thickness when you're done, you gotta go with heavier gauge metal. The advantage for enamelists is, is that this, you spin the forms and the metal's pretty thin and lightweight, so by the time they add the, add the enamel to them, they aren't just tremendously heavy. So the spinning process does lend itself to um, enameling. This is Tom Lund, new, new at enameling, bought these forms specifically from um, Thompson Enamel. So they're really basic generic forms, um, but a really a great way to dive right in and start learning enameling. So um, Karen is um, somebody who's trying to kind of create Fabergé eggs, but these are both spun parts that she's come back in and done the metal work on and then done the enameling. So um, Jane Harrell, she's awesome. Texas, um, I've done a lot of spinning for her in the past. I don't do that for people anymore. But these are some 19-inch um, platters that I spun for her. Then she takes them into her studio and she alters them, cuts them, forms them, shapes them, and then enamels them. And she's had a really great success with these as wall pieces. So, and I love the fact that they really don't look like they've just come off a lathe. You know, you've got just these blank canvases, one right after another, instead of having to make them all. Um, so, and then she has a wonderful, quirky uh, personality in some of her work. So this is her dinnerware set. And then she's kind of moved into sculptural pieces. So this is a found object, um, and the bottom um, hemisphere is spun. So she's now using it as just a small component of her sculptures. And same thing with this piece here. The bottom is the um, spun. Um, copper piece. So Gretchen Goss teaches at um, the Cleveland Art Institute and she has these large um, discs spun for her and they're about 24 inches in diameter and then she does a lot of photo um, enameling, photo etching on them and they're just really magnificent pieces and uh, they're always so much better when you see them in person. Um, but these are her forms that she's working with. very um, clay-like in the way of her surfaces. And then these are wall pieces at a gallery. Um, Judy Stone is out of uh, Oakland, California, and I've done a lot of spun forms for her in the past, and I love the fact that she cuts them up, burns them, tears them, um, stitches them, and, and rivets them back together again. Uh, but they're really lovely landscapes as far as I'm concerned. Our next presenter, who I know is very relaxed now, um, Travis, Travis Walburn, who's been doing a great job helping us with some tech stuff on his, uh, on his laptop, which we're really appreciative of. Travis Walburn's from Aculine in lovely Fremont, and he'll unmask the truths about photochemical etching. It's a remarkable and versatile process that we can all access. The company's name is Aculine. So please welcome Travis Walburn. Uh, thank you. As he said, my name is Travis. Let me just set up here real quick. 
All right, so the name of our company is Aculine or MetalCars.com. What we do is we chemically etch through uh, stainless steel, copper, brass, uh, sheet metal. Um, we can go over the specifics of like how much, like what we can do, our tolerances and all that stuff later. But uh, so what we do, the process here, we get, first we get designs in from artists and it has to be like on a vectorized file or like an illustrator file. And so we, uh, we, print, the, we print the film on the, uh, on the Liberator here, this OIO Instruments. It's a high temperature, really accurate down to the .001 thousandths. Uh, you can't get that accurate with like, just like punch cutting metal, you have to etch chemically through. So we do machine parts, as you see here. These parts right here on this film in the bottom right are for like an Aston Martin or a Toyota MR2. They go right in the dash there. You can just etch the, you can just etch the design right on the front of the film. And so, Here's the light table weeks, but we uh, register all those films with these little X's. Uh, it's really, really accurate. Um, you have, the design has to be on 11 and a half by 18 inch restriction on the film because our exposed machine is really small. So here we go to repairing the material. Um, you can ship your material in. We have to uh, verify that it works with our, our, exposed, material, our exposed machine and our, um, our laminating machine because, as you see, we can only do 12 inch or 24 inch or anything in between there. Uh, but first, we select which material is to be cut. We put it in the shearer, which is to the right or to the left there. Uh, pretty big. It's got like 50,000 pounds of pressure, but we can only cut 48,000 thick or 62,000 inch, 62, inch thick. So that's like a 16th of an inch thick of metal. We can't do very thick metal at all. But after it's cut, we put it through the laminator. Um, it puts this photo resist on it. And so after it, it has the photo resist with your design that you send, to the, uh, you send to the website, they're exposed for like seven seconds. And then that, den that densifies the uh, plastic. And then like after it's um, you know, exposed, we have like this, the, this is the 12 inch on top. And then the, 20, the, the biggest one are special orders, but they're very expensive because they're so time consuming. Uh, the next slide, we got, after they're densified, we put it through the developer. Um, that, that takes off all the soft plastic so that your design is on the metal itself. Like all the exposed metal is right there. You can see it. So that the chemicals can hit the metal, you know, etch through. After it's developed, we put it in the oven. It densifies the plastic even more so that the chemicals don't just, you know, uh, sweep off all that plastic. And then we go to the etching. So what happens is we have these the sheets. They come through the machine at the front there. We have it at a certain speed. So stainless is really, really hard. It's like a, it's just like, it takes the longest to etch. So, um, you know, they go through about well, like an eight, but that like, that doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so the right here, we have the ferric chloride and muriatic acid. That's the solution we use to cut through the metal. It is very, it's like really skin irritants. Like, uh, I don't do that. Steve does that, but um, <laughs> I complain about it too much. That's why I'm upstairs now. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, etch, we put the metal through, it etches it at whatever speed and it comes out. After it's done, we put it in the alkaline baths. And so that takes off all the plastic exposing your parts. Um, to the bottom left there, that's just a, that's just a plain brass sheet. That's 10,000 thick. So you're seeing what kind of like size we can do here. That's about the normal size sheet that we do. Um, anything bigger than that, uh, special circumstances, usually it costs more because it takes more time and we're just not really set up for that. We're kind of set up for a mass production, kind of like you get 20 sheets in, they have like 50 jewelry parts on there and then, you know, the artist can pull them out and deburr them or we can do that. Um, but yeah, so we get the alkaline baths, it strips it of all the plastic, we put it in an oven, uh, totally dries, uh, bare metal is left, it's, you see the finished product here. Uh, after it's dried and rinsed, we, um, you can see the tabs here kind of a little bit. I don't know if you can see specifically, like right there and right there. Um, so those tabs keep the metal in there. We pull them out. And so after they're done, we, deburr, we can deburr them on the belt sander there. And then we also have the grinder wheel here that polishes them. And then here's our scrap metal. So you can kind of see you know, how the parts are organized inside of the sheet, you know, what we do. We mostly do metal business cards, but uh, for artists, we do cater to artists. Uh, we do like a sheet by sheet pricing. So it's uh, anywhere from 75 to 100 to 125, depending on like how thick your sheet is. Um, pricing is really Greg's thing though. So I'm just kind of like the upstairs facilitator. I just kind of get all the work done. But uh, so you can see the scrap metal here. I don't have the stainless in there, but the copper and brass, you can really see like 
how the sheets are set up and how you can pull them out and stuff. So we're really set up for mass production. So anything that you want to do, it's not really going to, can't, we can't really do like one sheet. We can, but it's going to be more expensive for you in the end if you just do one because we're more set up for doing mass sheets at a time. Um, like I said, again, our tolerances for stainless, we can only do um, 20,000 inch thick to cut through because after a while, the acid will start to like flood into the metal and just kind of cut sideways instead of cutting through all the way. So we can only do uh, 20 thousandths thick for stainless, but for copper and brass, since it's soft, we can do 30 thousandths thick to cut through. And um, you know, we can surface etch a max up to 16 thousandths, or a sixteenth of an inch, like I said, like I said um, or 62 thousandths. Um, etching is accurate, like I said, to the point one thousandths thick, or to the one thousandths thick. So it's like, the most accurate, you can only, the only thing more accurate is laser, but that is not mass production. You're gonna pay a lot more for laser than you are for etching. But uh, you know, for artists, like, how accurate do you need to be? You know, like, it's not a machine part. <laughs> Gotta have some room for creativity, right? So we can only etch ferrous metals, no titanium, no platinum, uh, no silver, no gold, uh, no aluminum, too soft. Aluminum will like evaporate into the ferric chloride. But uh, yeah, like I said, pricing is totally custom to what each customer orders. Um, you know, so there's our contact info. Um, like I said, I can't really like specify on the pricing or all of the tolerances because I'm not really aware as to what Greg really wants to do with those special huge orders because they're really catered to, uh, you know, you have to really convince Greg to do it because he's kind of, you know, <laughs> a little bit crotchety. Um, <laughs> but so yeah, we, we can do those huge, you know, like 24 inch by 24 inch orders if you need. We do some for like this guy that does, um, we do these huge sheets and then we, he wraps it around these lamps. And then he put, he, that's his thing, like he just wraps it around these lampshades. It's like a big brass sheet and it's really cool. And it comes out and it's all like, he, I think he has it patinaed. We can also do a patina darkening, like if I go back to here. See, that's the jacks, with, uh, we can we get a patina darken brass, bronze, copper, and uh, Whatever like text you may have, like whatever, um, if you wanted to do like some saying on like you know a little label or something, then we could like we could darken those letters inside of the copper so that they're black, so that you know you don't have like orange background with orange text inside. You can also have your text to be black or whatever design you wanted on whatever plating you had or whatever jewelry you wanted to do. We can also for brass uh, do like some kind of. Uh, it looks like nickel silver plating. It's kind of like German silver, I guess you wouldn't say. Um, but we can, we can plate uh, brass, but that's more, again, you gotta talk to Greg about that. But you can see here the finished product when I'm talking about with the darkening is um, on these black market custom cards. They're obviously labels, they have rivet holes here, so we can die cut through. And we can etch on the front and back. So we're not limited to one surface, but we are limited to 2D. Uh, we also do a lot of stencils. Um, if I go back here on the film that I was holding up earlier. All right, like right here. Anyway, so this film is kind of give you a better idea of what, like, like how the films are set up. So you send them into Greg. Um, he can do the graphic design. If you're not really sure like what you want, you can discuss with him uh, what you want to put on the films. Uh, like I said, these are, um, you know, these are like shift knob, these are like shift knob labels and uh, little, uh, I don't know, just like little things. Like this one's for a James Bond car. It's like the rocket launcher button kind of thing like that, you know. Um, this guy's crazy about Aston Martins. I have no idea. Um, but yeah, so we set up the films. Uh, we can do front and back. Just make sure when you're doing your designs that they don't overlap because they will etch through if the, if the emulsion meets on the film. Uh, so we, you have to all, you have to like, you have to stack like your design on the film if you send it in. If you have any questions at the end here, I'll be sitting right there for 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so here's our contact info. Uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, how do I put it in? Oh, I'll just leave it be. All right, there you go. Since we can't figure out how to get the contact information off, you, will, you can just bask in it for a little while. Anyway, you know, I just love what's happening here because, you know, if you looked at what Lynn was showing in Harlan Butt's work, 
Here it was spun, enameled, and then it was also had cast elements in it too. So everything's really, really coming together, which, which I love. Our final uh, outsourcing speaker, uh, he may have lasered a ring for you. And if you participated in the online community of jewelry makers and metalheads known as Orchid, for good or for ill, you've read our first speaker's informative posts. Ace Bench jeweler Peter Rowe will speak about the full service trade shop. Please welcome Peter. This is perhaps the least glamorous of the presentations, and I don't have a bunch of unglamorous slides to bore you with, so if you want to take a nap, now's the time. Um, outsourcing um, is a term I've not used for what we do before, possibly because of its current unpleasant uh, associations with Bain Capital, with whom I have no connections whatsoever. Um, but full service trade shops or partial service trade shops, trade shops are an integral part of the jewelry industry and they can serve a number of uses for you. Many of us were trained in art schools and we were trained to be renaissance people, able to do everything. Um, the truth of the matter is it doesn't work that way. We all develop our own specialties um, and there are always holes in our abilities a couple of these things are rather typical. Many people come out of an art school not really being able to set much more than a simple bezel. This may be because the people who taught them uh, themselves never worked in the industry and didn't really develop the skills to be good at, for example, bead setting or channel setting. Um, and there are specialists out there who never went to an art school who can set circles around anybody in this room, including me. Um, so those are the people who you might want to occasionally use if you are using uh, stone setting techniques, engraving techniques, uh, if you need to do appraisals on your work. Um, literally almost any of the techniques that are used in jewelry that are often thought of as specialties. Uh, you may do some of it. Chances are you're not doing absolutely the best work and all of us want the pieces that we produce to be at the highest level. And rather than muddle through it, uh, let some expert do it. It'll save you time, it'll save you money, and it frees you up to increase your productivity. You get more done in the time that you're working on the piece because the drudge work is shopped out to somebody else who can do it better. Um, let's see. I remember when I was first taking stone setting classes from GIA, the instructor, came up with a little phrase that I've always liked. Uh, we were talking about channel setting and prong setting and bead setting, and then he said one of the most important techniques to learn is a setting method he called the three by five method. And we're all wondering, what in the dickens is that? And he said, well, it's where you put your work in a three by five mailing box and send it to someone who actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> yeah, cute. Um, when working with trade shops, the first step, of course, is finding the people, um, and this is somewhat difficult because if you open the yellow pages, what you're going to find is all of the listings for people who want to do work for the public. That can help you if you go talking to those people. Some of them are also trade shops, but many of them are the retail jewelers. Uh, if you talk to a retail jeweler about where they get their work done, sometimes they will tell you, sometimes they won't because they would rather take it in and charge you a uh, markup over the shop that they're going to send it to anyway, where what you really wanted was the name of that shop. So your best bet is asking outside of the retail jewelers. That would be places like Seattle Findings, other suppliers, your fellow jewelers, and people who've already worked with trade shops. Word of mouth is the way these things get advertised. I don't have an advertising listing anywhere, but I do trade work for an, a number of people. Um, and some of them are happy with my work, some of them regret uh, the process. It illustrates the fact that even within trade shops, no one shop is going to do it all. We all have our specialties, we all have the things that we do well and the things that we don't do so well. And that brings up, when you're working with a trade shop uh, or with a trade person or any outsourcing whatsoever, one of the key factors is communication. I don't know anybody who ever got a good grade in telepathy. And it's very easy to think that what you want is obvious to anybody with a brain, only to find that that person with a brain had somewhat of a different idea based on what you didn't tell them. 
So communication is key. When you find someone you're going to work with, uh, be sure you discuss all of the possible aspects. You want to discuss pricing, what's it going to cost before you get the bill. You want to discuss what's it supposed to look like. In the case of stone setting, how do you want it set? For example, in bead setting, there's half a dozen different styles. If you have a whole row of stones set just in a line, you can have stones absolutely girdle to girdle close together, or there can be a little bit of a space. You can have between each stone shared prongs, individual prongs, so that you have four beads per stone instead of two individual beads between each stone. You can spread it apart a little bit more so that there's five beads in between. There can be some engraved designs in there. All of these things are subtle variations. And if you just take your work to this shop and you say, OK, I want these things bead set in a line, you may not know what you're going to get if you didn't talk about it first. Um, how do you know if they're any good at it? Well, they may have samples to show you. They may not. If you are not dealing with someone who's been recommended to you so that you can trust what's going on, I would recommend giving them a test piece first. Instead of giving them your masterpiece that has to come out right, give them another piece that maybe is, is fine if it comes out, but it won't be a great loss if it doesn't, and see what they can do. Uh, if they're a really good setter, you'll be happy with the result. If they're not, it's better to find out on a test piece. Um, next thing with communication is write it down. Uh, one of the things about many of these specialties is that they take time to learn. And often the people who do it the best are no longer 22 years old. And that means occasionally there may be one or two brain cells that isn't so good at remembering anymore. Um, not me, of course. Um, I remember everything except, let's see, where was I in this talk? Um, write it down. That includes all of the details you would never think you would possibly have to write down. Uh, first and foremost is your name on a job envelope and your phone number. You would be amazed how often I get a job envelope where I have to add that information because the person who brought it to me forgot to tell me who they were. I, I may know, but if I don't write it down and then later I'm looking at this envelope and I have a question, if I don't have a phone number to call, that can be a problem. So name and address, that's the real simple things. Put down what is in the job envelope. I need to know what you've sent me. In case I've dropped the envelope and everything's in my bench pan, I need to know what I need to find. Uh, that doesn't happen. That, that doesn't happen. I don't <laughs> drop, I never drop things, which is good because if you've seen my bench pan, I'd never find anything. Um, yeah, put down what's in there. Uh, if you have stones in there, tell me what they are, what size they are, what grades they're supposed to be, um, how many. If you're getting them set, tell me where you want them set, what order, exact positions. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Pictures plus words are worth even more. Uh, an example of that would be a band I did not long ago where the uh, client gave me a nice little sketch. Here's a bunch of stones. We want them set here, 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 and here. And I followed her sketch exactly. Trouble is, she couldn't draw. What she really wanted was very precise spacing, and I thought she wanted random spacing um, based on her drawing, and that was an unfortunate oversight. I should have asked, yeah, but I didn't. She should have told me, and she didn't. That's avoidable. So information uh, is key. Names, contacts, numbers, instructions, pictures, uh, what's in there, gradings, etc. Anything that you might possibly want to know about that job that you already think you know that I don't yet know. Put it on the envelope. And the envelope itself, make it something that's going to be reasonably sturdy that I can close. I've gotten jobs delivered to me in slightly torn sandwich bags, in rolled up paper bags, um, just a handful of parts handed to me loose that I had to put into. Don't do that. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> The standard in the industry are manila envelopes, usually, you know, little things like that. You can use big ones if you want. That keep, make sure they don't get lost. But it can be closed. You can write the instructions on it. Uh, it keep th keeps things clear. Um, know what you're going to get. Make sure the person you're working with knows what you expect to get. That way there's no unpleasant surprises. Um, in terms of the things that I do, for people, well, it depends on where you where you ask. I have a full-time job for a local manufacturer where we.
do custom work, trade work for some people in the trade. Uh, you may have heard of Schult Jewelers, uh, been in town for, I don't know, 70 some years, 1937, however long that is. We're in the old Rainier Brewery building. If you need custom manufacturing in platinum or palladium or steel, well, maybe we can help you. Um, be aware, and don't tell my boss I said this, we're not exactly the cheapest in town. <laughs> Has something to do with two people owning the business, both of whom want to be paid an executive wage, and they're doing it with what I make for them. I also work out of my house. I may be one of the few people in town with a laser welder in their basement. Um, when Schultz bought a laser welder, I don't know, 12 years ago, I fell in love with the thing immediately, for primarily what it could do for platinum fabrication. If any of you have worked with platinum, you know that you're spending an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to hold the pieces in position to solder them, how to solder them when you can't really see what's going on. The solder tends to blow away when you hit it with a torch. Laser welders solve that. A nice little weld to hold things in position, and the welds are a little flexible, so you can adjust the position until things are right where you want it. Then you use the laser again to tack the little piece of solder in place. Done deal. It can cut the time for platinum fabrication literally in half. Or you can skip solder altogether and weld the parts uh, directly. There are some limitations to laser welding. Laser welders, if you talk only to the manufacturers who are trying to sell, sell you a laser, they get uh, presented as magic wands that can do absolutely everything, including make your lunch. Um, that isn't actually the case. There are some significant limitations to laser welders, as with pretty much every other technique out there that you might think of. The first thing to keep in mind is that a laser welder works with an infrared beam of light, very tight. It's focused at a single little point, converges on that point as kind of a cone shape, and then diverges again. And, and at that point, uh, the heat, the infrared, you can't see it, but it's very hot. It's hot enough to weld. But it's still a beam of light, and we're talking about welding metal. And what happens when you shine a beam of light at a piece of metal? It reflects. This is something to keep in mind with a laser, because anywhere from 94 to 99 percent of the beam reflects right off of the metal, and the remainder has to be enough energy to melt that metal and weld it. The stuff that reflects off is going somewhere. If it just hits you in the finger, well, ouch, no big deal. It's like touching a hot pan. If it reflects in a direction which hits that tourmaline you were trying to set, um, you will be buying another tourmaline. Working with these things is not completely free of danger. When you're working on very thin metal, it's sometimes uh, all too easy to burn right through it and hit the stone underneath when you were trying to build up a prong. There's a good deal of skill involved in using these, and laser welder operators have varying degrees of skill, and they have varying levels of equipment. Some of the laser welders are more capable than others um, and will do things that others don't do. Another thing that makes laser welders differ from techniques you're used to with a torch, when you take two pieces of metal and you go to solder them with a torch, you're heating up both pieces of metal to the soldering temperature. When you heat up metal, everything expands including the joint, and as it cools, everything contracts again. Fine. When you work with a laser welder, you're hitting a very tiny bit of an otherwise cold piece of metal, which you're probably holding in your fingers when you're working, uh, with a beam that melts a very tiny spot. The metal around the weld stays relatively cool. As that molten pool solidifies and cools, it shrinks. The result is that laser welds, unlike solder joints, are work hardened. The degree to which their work hardened depends on the ductility of the metal. Some metals, some white golds, some of the lower carat golds, um, work hardened to the point where as it cools, the wells have a tendency to crack. You can get around that by choosing your alloy carefully, but there are some alloys which are very difficult to laser weld without getting weld cracks. That can be a limitation when you want something laser welded, uh, and only the person who owns that laser welder will tell you if his machine will have a tendency to crack that alloy, and maybe they won't know until they try it. Um, again, the laser welders are not universal magic. There's some metals they simply do not work well on. Uh, pure silver, pure gold, pure copper are so reflective 
of infrared, that it's difficult to get enough energy into the metal to actually melt anything. Silver in particular, fine silver is almost impossible to weld. You can do it with difficulty, but the way you do it is by using a filler metal for the weld, just as though you were doing stick welding with an arc welder. A filler metal that isn't fine silver, you use something that's uh, uh, got a little bit of alloy in it that lowers the melting point, that lowers the amount of the infrared that is absorbed by the metal and allows it to weld. So you may end up with what you think should have been a seamless weld. We think of welding as being all the same metal. Laser welding is not always the same. Sometimes you're using a filler metal of a different metal. And at that point, there is a certain resemblance to a solder seam in that you have a seam with a slightly different filler than you have in the parent metal around it. Add to that 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 weld is slightly work hardened. And you may find that that seam is not as invisible as you'd like, particularly when you go to polish it and you find there's a difference in hardness. All of these are limitations that you need to discuss. Um, that means how well can it be welded? How much will the weld show? Uh, how strong will it be compared to a solder seam? Is welding actually the best way to, to work with it? And these are questions to ask if you're having me or somebody else laser weld a thing. These are also questions to ask if you're talking to Rio Grande and they're trying to talk you into buying a laser welder. You might want to sit down with some samples of what uh, you intend to do with it and see how well it works because they are not universal machines. Neither, of course, is any torch or a PUK welder or any other technique you want to do. They all have limitations. But most of the equipment that you might want to buy from Rio Grande isn't $30,000. So, well, they've come down quite a bit in price. But the ones that have come down in price are the less capable machines. So they are uh, they're magic wands, but they're magic wands with a limit. Another consideration to talk about when you're dealing with trade shops away from laser welders, again, is confidentiality. You guys are doing your own designs. The typical trade shop is doing your work for you, but some of them are also selling their own work, are also producing for other jewelers, maybe selling on the side. You want to make sure that when they're done with your job, they're not going to go out and copy what they just did for you and sell it uh, on their own. Have that discussion. This is particularly true if you're doing casting work, if you're dealing with somebody other than outcast, uh, there are some casters out there who I have seen, and it was not in Seattle, this was back when I was in Detroit, uh, there was a small casting firm that uh, I know of that would automatically make a mold of everything they cast for someone else, and they just had these designs on file when they had somebody want something, and that's cheating. But if you don't have that discussion, um, Maybe they don't think of it as cheating. You would be surprised at the variability in the ethics that one finds in an industry which in some ways still thinks it's in the mid-1800s. Uh, meanwhile, we know we're in the 21st century, but there's some people who haven't figured that out. Uh, so yeah, talk about confidentiality. Um, another one to have a discussion about is liabilities. Trade shops do not always carry full liability insurance for everything they work on. I'm an example, for example. I can't afford the, the, the types of insurance that would be required for me to be liable for every last stone I set for everybody. So when I do stone setting for people, I have a limit to the degree to which I will pay for things I break. And it's logical enough. Can I afford to replace it? I know those limits. I will tell you what those are if you have something you want me to do. If you bring me a $20,000 stone to set, I'm going to say this is at your risk. And you need to understand what that involves. No stone setter is completely immune from accidents. No laser welder is in, completely immune from accidents. So have that discussion. Who carries the liability? If the person you want to have do your work is not able to accept full, reliability, or full liability for that work, and there is any significant risk, you need to decide whether that's a risk you wish to take or whether you need to find a larger shop that may be fully insured. Um, I can't stress that one enough because I know any number of people who have simply assumed, A, that the craftsman is perfect and nothing will ever go wrong, and B, that if something goes wrong, wrong no matter what it is, they will automatically get full replacement, and that is seldom actually the case. So have that discussion. Um, if there needs to be changes, 
Are we running out of time? We're out of time. Okay. Well, so time. To wrap up the point. If there, are, if there, oh, I was going to say, if there need to be changes in what you want done, uh, have that discussion beforehand, so that the shop knows not to be creative with your ideas, but to call you instead. And I assume you'll have more questions, and we can deal with those in the question and answer session. Thank you. Now. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, all of you guys, especially James, who's been up here for three and a half hours um, under hot baking lights like a French fry at McDonald's. Um, now's your time to ask some questions. Of course, you can ask at lunch as well. So we've got about 10 minutes of, uh, of question time in. So start popping them. Yeah, just shout it out. Yeah. Uh, so this question is for Travis. And I work with your company a lot. I usually work with Frank. And by the way, Frank's always really nice to me. <laughs> okay. It's always really nice to me. Anyway, you guys have done a lot for me. And I just want to clarify one thing. Hopefully not embarrassing you. No. But if you guys itch on non non Ferris. Yeah. Not Ferris. Um, in 2010, you guys did a, an etching of some type on nickel. Yes. Now, now I mean, told that you guys don't use nickel. Well, not nickel, but nickel silicone. Which is nickel, basically. Well, yeah. We, we Which is? We just screwed it. We're the same thing. Same thing as we did in the Same thing. We did in the Yeah. So Tina did it for me, but Greg's been telling me that you can't do nickel. Uh, I think he has to be like, you know, more than not really trying to be more than more, but that's where I focus in the more on the So if I brought you the sheet, but yes, you bring in your own label, and you bring in all your materials, we can do that. Okay, okay. Travis, I was confused by your specifications about how you need to provide the images. Right. I don't know about vector files, but if I have the HTML, <coughs> Uh, yes. Uh, we, we we'll read the email with the attachment, and then he can uh, he can see if we can do it or not. And then if he can, he can trace over your design if it's a JPEG or anything. But usually, if it's a vector, we can directly print it uh, from the email, give you a proof before we do it, and then. Um, Usually, if we do the graphic design for you, it's like a $60 setup charge or $100, depending on you know, how complex your design is. And then from that film, uh, we can't just put a picture onto a piece of metal. Like, I want to stress that to you. Like, we always get customers like, wanting their, 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 their picture on a piece of metal. But we have to vectorize each line, because we have to be able to manipulate every single line in the design before we can etch it. So. Pictures don't work, but we can trace over very simple pictures. Like we can trace over with those lines and then paint fill them in so that we can fill mass surface areas. But um, other than that, yeah, just a vectorized file. We have to be able to completely manipulate everything that we can in the in the design so that we can add tabs. You know that need to be, you know, say your jewelry is a little bit weak in one spot, so we can add a tab on there. You know, very subtly, and that goes with the design so that your jewelry is still intact within that piece of metal. You know, just like customizing it. So we have to, we just have to have complete control over the design before we can do anything with that metal. So I hope that answered your question. All right. Awesome. Next one. Yes. Uh, yes, but it is very, it's variable. We can't really, we can't really. Um, it, we can try to measure it, but it's like it's all up in the air with chemicals, like. The acid's going to edge through as fast as it wants to. We can't, we can't, we can, we can check the pressures and how like hard we're pressing against the metal. But other than that, like, we can try to get as deep as deep or as not deep as you want. 
but uh, it's not really as accurate as just you know the die cutting and then the width of it as long as uh, uh, compared to the depth. We can't really control the depth as much. We're just asking about 3D. Yeah. Here's, here's, an, here's another name to put on there is Prestige Jewelers in the 4th and Pike building. Good people. I've worked with them. Um, Prestige Jewelers in the 4th and Pike building. Same building that Ed is in, except Ed is one person uh, who I've had variable results with, but I didn't say that. Um, I hope you and Travis have jobs after all this is over. <laughs> Dana. Um, I spun pieces that are half inch in diameter. You start getting smaller than that. The patterns at that point have to be made out of steel because the wood won't hold up any longer. But actually the pair of earrings I have on were spun originally before I cut them apart and put them back together again. So you, you're talking something half inch and then in industry they spin things that are 10 feet in diameter. So. I don't know of anybody that's working that small. I'm working that small, but yeah. Come talk to me. <laughs> well, sometimes there's you can't somebody to do silver for you or gold for you or something like that, and depending on where I'm at with what I'm doing. So, yeah, I encourage people to actually learn the process because through learning the process, so many things you stumble across that just happen. So. Um, I would like to say just one thing about AccuLine. One of the things that I've had my students do is go with their designs, their black and whites, eight and a half by 11 mm -hmm. down, and have them etch on steel, and then take those steel plates and use them for roll printing. And for me, it's very sustainable in the sense that you're using the etching process once, but you're being able to produce multiple parts off of that original hazardous waste cost that's involved in it. And so I think that's one of the wonderful things that they can do is provide um, dies for you guys for printing. If you go to any of the um, spinning companies that are here locally, you'll go back and you'll look on the wall and they'll have hundreds and hundreds of patterns that are already made for, you know, because they usually own the patterns. And so you can go through and you can point and have them pull them off the wall and you can actually have forms spun off of the forms that they own. It's just if you want a specific shape, then you're going to have to hire them to make that pattern. Um, and there is a certain limitation of how many forms you can come up with, and so I, there's, they're pretty close. I would really encourage just to take a field trip to go see what Vans has or, or Quality Metal Spinning has. So. Lynn? Yes? If you, um, if you do your own wood turning, can you talk to somebody who does the spinning to get the specifications for what they can handle as far as how it seems to go into their machines and then do your own? You mean altering the lathe so that it can be used as a spinning lathe as well? No, I mean like if, if you wanted to make your own um, form. Right, okay. Then, uh, like what wood do you work in and should you, you should probably talk to the people about what sort of thing. Right, I work with um, Eastern Hardwood Maple 
because I prefer to spend the money on it for toxicity, but they have um, different types of um, phenolic resin that they use in industry. They make their patterns out of aluminum sometimes. Sometimes they make them out of steel. But if you're a wind turner, you certainly could turn the patterns. Every lathe is a little bit different. So as you turn a pattern on one lathe and you take it over and you put it onto another lathe, you're going to lose maybe a sixteenth of an inch in truing it up just because of the, the nature of lathes. But e Eastern hardwood maple is what I work with. So, uh -huh. uh, actually, pure palladium is a very difficult metal to cast. And there is a really good shop in Portland called Techform, and they are it for if you want palladium casting. As far as palladium white golds, uh, we do actually cast the palladium white golds. Um, right now, we're currently using Hoover and Strong's alloys which are actually nice if you do granulation work. You can granulate on the palladium white gold alloys. But Techform is the go-to for the pure palladium casting. Ah, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I'm speaking of the uh, Hoover and Strong alloy that they call pure palladium. But I mean, it's, it's still not totally pure. It's not straight up we palladium. completely pure and it was sponge. You can actually find die struck parts that are made from pure palladium and they're kind of purple. Do you have a question in the middle up there? Me? A few, yeah. Yes, Peter, I was wondering if um, in your You can get around it a little by using Argentium or Sterlium Plus that uh, Stellar or um, United Precious Metal cells, both of those alloys laser fairly well at lower power settings. But pure sterling silver not only tends to crack, you get brittle welds, but um, it takes an awful lot of power and not all of the welders out there will do it. If any of you have ever tried to put sterling ear posts on a piece of sterling jewelry using a sparky welder, you'll have noticed the same problems. Sometimes the things just come right off and there's no particular rhyme or reason to it, but the wells, whether it's fusion welding or laser welding, don't seem to hold up very well. So. We've got two more questions. Uh, James, uh, do you, Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. But uh, so one of the things that happens a lot is uh, we do a fair amount of work with retail stores. And they'll bring us, their clients brought grandma's ring and grandma's earrings and grandma's pendant. And one of the things to keep in mind is most gold alloys are different across the board. You'll have a different alloy that's used for making sheet and tubing. You'll have a different alloy that's used for a die struck part. You'll have a different alloy that is used for a cast part. And then a lot of those parts will also have solder in them. So if you have a pair of tubing earrings from the 70s and a cast ring from the 50s, and there's a little bit of solder on those tubing earrings, usually the solder will balance out the difference between those alloys, but it's, it's always a gamble if you're using old metal. We've found ways to get around it, and we've had good results, but it's still kind of a gamble sometimes. And then we also tend to go through everything that comes in. Uh, oftentimes, we'll find stuff that is uh, gold-plated steel that's trying to be used as gold. Not so good to cast with. <laughs> but yes, we do. Uh, but we usually like people to provide enough material to cover the weight of the total casting so we don't have issues of cross-contaminating our inventory. Good question. Yeah. We have time for one more great question. Go uh, No, we don't. And actually, Techform casts steel right now. As far as I understood, I've never had any cast there. Um, Steel is one we don't have the gear to do it. It has to be cast in a closed chamber. Thanks. 
Well, um, you can continue to ask questions, of course, during lunch, and they don't really have to eat, so just keep them busy. Ask away, ask away.